I never had the chance to be the boy next door. I kept on dreaming about the man that I want to be today. If I could talk to him, this what I say. Yeah, I'll find you there in the sunrise. I'll be caught up in the spring. I'll find you there in the ocean. I swear I shit won't sing. We be dancing with the stars, jamming in the car. Even if it ain't mine, you vibe with me. I'll find you there. I'll find you there. I'm sick and tired of missing out on loving every season. I'm letting go of all the pride and shame that I've been keeping. I gotta keep my head up. I'm moving on. I gotta see it through If I could talk to love, this what I say Yeah, I'll find you there In the sunrise, I'll be caught up in the spring I'll find you there In the ocean, I swear I shit won't sing We be dancing with the stars, jamming in the car Even if it ain't mine, you vibe with me Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar on finance for a generative world. Good to see everyone today, familiar faces, some names in the chat or in the participants I haven't seen in a while. So good to have you back uh, with us and obviously to all the new people as well. Thanks for jumping in and joining us in our webinar today. So just a reminder or just to let you know if you haven't heard of the Capital Institute, we are an organization that is really dedicated to um, transforming our financial and economic systems through a regenerative lens. And we do this mainly through educational programs. So we have online courses that we offer, uh, one on the introduction to regenerative economics, which is an eight-week course. And then we have a series that's coming up, a finance for a regenerative economy, um, which is a two-part um, program. So our first one starting in May on the 8th and the second part's in November. So if you're curious about our work after this webinar, uh, you can check out more about our courses there. But just grateful to be spending this time together. I see people already putting in the chat where they're from. Please continue with that. I always love to see the different places. Um, and if you can turn your video on just so we can see you, we also wanna see the faces. So um, good to have you here. And I'm gonna welcome John. He's gonna jump us straight into our session today. He's going to take us through a bit of a slide um, and presentation, and then we'll leave some time at the end for Q&A. This is an hour session for those um, who are wondering how long they're committed to spending time with us. Uh, so we're going to try to honor that hour um, and really leave space at the end for some, yeah, any reflections and questions and to bring your voice in the room. So good to have you here. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to John. Hey, thank you, Rachel, and greetings, everyone. As I mentioned in the chat, I'm, I'm um, speaking to you from uh, Tangier, Mar Morocco, which is the end of a three-week journey for me. So um, if I seem a little tired, it's because I am, but I'm excited to, um, to, to share uh, the story about this upcoming course with you all. Um, I noticed that there's a Matthew Fullerton out there. Um, I can't find your face yet, but... Uh, you get uh, you get special treatment in the course. Um, somehow we must be related, and I, I'm also seeing some some very familiar faces. Uh, I, I noted Carmen's back. Um, Carmen is she must have taken every single one of our cohorts and courses, and she keeps coming back for more. So um, she's a good person to um, uh, to act as a, an ambassador for us. Um, but I'm I'm really excited about the finance course. You know I. Um, I was asked, gosh, over 10 years ago, um, uh, because of my background, I was asked to put together a 10-point plan for financial reform. And um, uh, I presented it at the uh, um, uh, Progressive Caucus in the US Congress. And I looked out into the room and I was just 
a bunch of blank stares facing me. And I realized that we couldn't talk about serious financial reform. This was in the wake of the financial crisis. And it, and it hit me that I couldn't talk about what I considered serious financial reform until we first developed what a regenerative economy needed to look like, uh, because the financial system needs to serve the regenerative economy. And so um, uh, we set about uh, thinking about what a regenerative economy might mean and fast forward 10 years or more. Um, and that idea is actually gaining some purchase in the world. The, the, uh, the conference I'm speaking at later this week uh, is called House of Beautiful Business. And their tagline now is uh, a network uh, or the network for a life-centered economy. So um, it's been a long journey for me, but um, the timing of you all joining, I think is very good. Um, I do believe that this idea is um, is going to be with us, I hope forever. And um, uh, But drilling down into the financial system uh, is really, in a sense, I think I see it as the key obstacle, but also the key, the key enabler to allowing a regenerative economy to, to actually manifest. And I was, to be honest, I was very frustrated uh, in the wake of the financial crisis. Everyone somehow became an expert on how to, fi how to fi fix the financial system. But a lot of the response to it was, in a sense, uh, coming at it from the spirit of how are we going to make sure that doesn't happen again? And how come the bad guys got away with it? And we didn't have the, um, uh, the serious uh, systemic analysis of what was wrong with the economy and what was wrong and what needed to change about our financial practices, the, both the ideology, um, the theoretical framework, and the way we practice finance. Um, and so, of course, the, the system really hasn't changed much. It's, it's been reinforced um, uh, by massive central bank intervention. But the game hasn't really changed. And shockingly, we're finding that it's become a key obstacle to uh, everything is, as, in, as vital and critical but straightforward as financing renewable energy to actually um, creating uh, the conditions for a healthy economy and a healthy human and, and ecological um, uh, outcome in the process. So we're, we're really at the beginning of this. And um, I don't think there's anything more important that I can contribute to the poly crisis challenge we're facing than a, a very serious and um, uh, sophisticated um, uh, diagnosis and, and analysis of what's wrong with our financial system, but in a way that avoids the complexity and the, the language that finance sort of isolates itself from. I, I actually think what I'm going to teach in this course and what we're all going to explore together is, is quite uh, straightforward and common sense and avoids um, uh, much of the, the complexity that we've allowed finance to become. So that's um, a little bit of context. Uh, I'm going to go through fairly quickly some slides just to keep me on task here, and then we'll have plenty of room for, um, for questions and discussion. So, is that working for everybody? Good, okay. Uh, so, um, just real briefly, I'm gonna share a little bit of my story for many of you who don't know me, um, uh, how I got into this. Um, and then, as I mentioned, talk about the um, uh, sort of the high level uh, what regenerative finance means, and then we're going to talk about the specifics in this uh, program. And um, there's a great book by John Ralston Saul um, uh, that um, I, I highly recommend. Um, and since I'm tired, I'm blanking on the name of it. But out of it, um, uh, there's a great quote, which is, I remind you that Socrates was executed not for his megalomania, or gratuitous uh, or grandiose propositions or certitudes, but for stubbornly stubbornly doubt for stubbornly doubting the absolute truths of others, and I think that's the essence of what we need to do to interrogate finance is to doubt the truths that that um, others have have given us, 
uh, about what finance is, what it needs to be. Uh, it is the way it is. We need to work within the system. All of these absolute truths need to be um, aggressively questioned. And one of my heroes, Wendell Berry, um, says it incredibly succinctly. Um, he says, our economy has become an anti-economy, a financial system. In other words, the economy has become a financial system without a sound economic basis or without economic virtues. And um, uh, I think if we're honest, that's, a, um, that's an accurate description of what's happened to the financial system. Um, and one needs to look no further than the recent fiasco um, uh, about the, um, the, the, the uh, Donald J. Trump stock, uh, the latest meme stock to be um, uh, trading on the public stock markets, which in my opinion should never have been allowed to happen. Um, it is a uh, it is a company that you know twenty years ago would never be taken public, but there's a workaround now that allows a company like this to be taken public with the full knowledge that it's going to be treated as a meme stock and um, uh, and trading at an, a ridiculous valuation. Um, this slide is a couple of weeks old. I haven't checked to see where it is today. I think it's been rallying again, but it it bears no truth to reality. It's purely uh, dangerous speculation. And of course, when this happens, eventually it ends in tears. And the people that end up getting hurt are are not the Donald Trumps of the world and not the people that organized uh, uh, this fiasco, but there's um, small savers who, who have been um, uh, suckered into this. And the fact that meme stocks is even a thing tells us how um, uh, how unhealthy the financial system has become. That was not a thing when I wrote my finance paper and was, wasn't was doing the um, uh, the analysis that created the foundation of this course. Um, neither was the, um, uh, the, the cryptocurrency, um, uh, you know, extraordinary um, uh, deceit that happened, um, you know, and, and there's now at least one person in jail uh, related to it. Um, what I'm going to talk about in the course, which follows the um, the economics course, and by the way, one question that is a, is a great question to ask is should we should I take the finance course um, after I've taken the economics course, or is it okay to take the finance course um, before the economics course? And and the answer is you can do it either way. Uh, honestly, it's probably better to do the economics course first. But if you haven't done the economics course, we share with you some of the early lectures so you can, in a sense, get a, a quick catch up on the, the foundational uh, living systems principles. And, and, and those are the same principles we apply to the financial system that we apply to the economic system. So it works either way, but, um, uh, but certainly it will be helpful if you've already experienced the, um, uh, the introduction to economics course. And the... Um, the big distinction between regenerative finance and this entire regenerative paradigm and all of the other good things we're doing to try to address both the economy and the financial system can be summarized in this um, uh, in, in this chart that is derived from some of Carol Sanford's work. Um, and if you start on the left, we have a, a financial system that is trapped in this reductionist paradigm that we're going to talk about. Um, it um, uh, it assumes that um, um, uh, uh, that extracting value is in many cases the purpose of of finance, and it's led to you know tremendous um, uh, uh, negative outcomes for both people and the planet, and and a lot of the work in what we call sustainable finance has has sort of fallen into this category of either arresting the disorder or even doing some good. Um, and, and the arresting disorder is, you know, things like getting better transparency on, on non-financial reporting, the whole ESG movement, um, uh, the, um, uh, the circular economy, closing a loop. And in the do good category, the, um, the SDGs are an example of that, the whole B Corp movement, the in impact investment movement, um, and many other um, uh, very positive developments. But all of these are um, are quite distinct from a living systems paradigm, and a living systems paradigm uh, is less about 
setting new goals and 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 fixing what's broken, but actually creating the conditions for health. And I think that the um, the obstacles that our current financial system and our finance ideology create for an economy that is uh, conducive to health, conducive to life, is um, is the big elephant in the room. And and the way I like to talk about it is, it's actually the the finance algorithm, this optimized risk adjusted returns, the internal rate of return calculation. The algorithm that drives finance and therefore drives economic decision making is actually in conflict with creating the conditions for health for the whole system. And we're going to talk about that in, in some detail in the course. Um, if you're not familiar with our, our regenerative economics paradigm, just a quick summary of some of the key ideas. The first premise is that the human economy is a living system. The second, and, and we can talk about that, but just accept it for now since we're going through this quickly. Uh, the second premise is that there are patterns and principles that, adri that describe how all living systems that have sustained themselves in the real, real world actually work. And that's now um, accepted science. We can debate and quibble over what exactly are those patterns and principles and how to describe them. But um, uh, these are, you know, essentially the the this is the science of systems ecology that is a brand new science in the scheme of things. It's really only developed in my lifetime. Um, it's not a science that many bankers and investors have been taught, but it is the foundation of, of thinking about a regenerative economy and a regenerative financial system. And the third premise is that if our human economy is to be sustainable over the long run, the system design must align with these same patterns and principles. Um, and of course, that will apply similarly to uh, to the financial system in service of that economy. Now, I'm by, by no means the first person to think of these ideas, um, but Mr. Fuller, some of you will, will know well, um, uh, in his last book, a uh, little short book called Grunch that was published the year he died back in the 1980s, he wrote that nature is a totally efficient, self-regenerating system. If we discover the laws that govern the system, I would use the term patterns and principles more than laws, and live synergistically within them, sustainability will follow and humankind will be a success. And if you had read his book, you would realize what he also meant, that is if we don't align our economy with these same patterns and principles, humankind will not be a success. And put uh, more simply, uh, Janine Benyus, the famous biologist who developed the concept of biomimicry, or wrote a book on biomimicry, um, says it very, very succinctly, nature creates conditions conducive to life. So again, it's this idea of creating conditions. If we want an economy that is aligned with the living, the process of life, if we want a regenerative financial system, we need to uh, align with this um, practice that nature magically does, which is it creates conditions conducive to more life. And so that brings us to the fourth premise for regenerative finance and regenerative uh, financial system is that holistically understood, the economy is embedded in the biosphere and the financial system is embedded in the real economy. So these same patterns and principles will need to apply to the financial system as they do um, uh, to the economy as a whole. So with that, we have a definition of, um, uh, of regenerative finance, which is the application of nature's laws and patterns of, of systemic health, self-organization, self-renewal, and regenerative vitality to finance theory and practice in order to create the conditions in which the potential of regenerative economies can emerge. And that's a mouthful. Um, uh, and, you know, we'll share this uh, with you later, but that's what we're going to be interrogating in this course is applying these um, eight principles of regenerative vitality to our financial theory and to finance practice in order to create the conditions in which the potential of regenerative economies can emerge, seeing finance as subservient to the economy in service to a regenerative economy, which is very different than the way finance is practiced, um, the, the classic confusion of means and ends. Now, this is a, um, uh, a very simple graph that explains how life works. Things grow exponentially for a while. Think of 
you know, a baby growing exponentially. And then eventually things grow slower and slower and eventually um, uh, they stop growing altogether. But think about the, um, the compounding um, um, algorithm of finance. It looks nothing like this. It in fact grows exponentially forever and therefore is in conflict with how life works. And that's a huge conundrum that we're gonna wrestle with. There's no simple solution to that. Um, um, but we're not going to duck it. We're going to, you know, this is the absolute truth that investment capital can compound returns exponentially forever is one of the absolute truths that we're going to interrogate uh, in some detail. And this, again, from uh, the study of, of ecology, in this case, uh, this is something called the adaptive cycle um, uh, developed by um, C.S. Holling and, and Gunderson. This is actually how life works over the long run. That same curve that you saw um, when, when we reach to the far upper right, eventually um, uh, after conservation of, uh, of energy and, and you know, maturation of a living system, eventually um, organisms die. And, and when they die, they decay. And when they decay, they release that energy that can reform into um, new forms of, of life. Um, think about how, how the composting process works. Um, and, then the, and then you start this process all over again. That's how life actually works. And if you're serious about an economy that's aligned with life and a financial system that is in service to an economy aligned with life, we need to think about what this implies for um, uh, finance and financial capital in particular. And I'm not, by the way, suggesting that everyone needs to cause their capital to 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 you know to turn into dirt and 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 go away, but we can't avoid um, this very challenging question, and we need to think about what this might mean for finance in general and for financial capital in particular. And the way I've described this is, um, uh, you know, the the system design is is the three mountain problem. And if we oversimplify different forms of capital into natural capital or, or the, you know, ecological capital, social capital uh, in all its forms from, um, uh, from relational capital to spiritual capital to uh, simply, you know, uh, the dignity of good work, all of the things that go into uh, social capital. If we think about the system that we've designed and, and played out now for several hundred years since the beginning of the modern age, we've essentially created a system that does what you're looking at. It extracts from natural capital. Um, it creates and extracts from social capital. So it's a bit oversimplified. But in the pursuit of growing this mountain of financial capital, and, it, and this system works pretty, pretty well. Um, and that's exactly what the system is designed to do. And that's exactly what it's done. And so um, uh, in the course, we're going to wrestle with that conundrum um, and think about alternative ways for finance to align with that adaptive cycle. And, and of course, we've already seen movements in this direction. Um, uh, so we're going to look at the different forms of investing in this investment course, ranging from the most extractive on the left and the areas where um, we're doing uh, arresting disorder and moving into the doing good um, uh, by aligning capital with things we know that need to happen. This is the whole impact investment field, something I've been involved in since I actually was still at Morgan back in 1997. I made an investment in a charter school company. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. And then newer ideas like blended capital, um, integral capital, which I've written about in the book, and then all of this stuff over on the right, which we'll talk about during the course, is kind of the future um, and my attempt to wrestle with those big issues that I have just summarized. And we're going to talk about those quite a bit in the course. Um, I was asked once, I, I wrote a paper early in this search, um, and, and we had a, um, at an impact investment conference, we had a plenary about it. And the paper was called The Purpose of Capital. And, and a group of us were on stage and talking and blah, blah, blah. And then this woman shot up her hand at the end of it and said, so John, exactly what is the purpose of capital? And without even thinking about it, what came out of my mouth, which is a, um, 
uh, a response that I think still think is as good as anything I could come up with today is that the purpose of capital is to serve life and not the other way around. And in fact, we've fallen into a trap where um, uh, we've allowed the purpose of capital to, um, uh, to be inverted and we actually have a system where life is serving capital rather than capital serving life. Um, so that's a quick over, overview of what we're going to go through in the um, in in the finance course. Um, uh, we've divided the course this time into two segments, or the program into two segments. One is on investment, and the second is on money and banking. Uh, and because of schedules and um, the desire to launch the next cohort of the um, economics uh, program in September. Um, we're splitting these up by time quite a bit. So the investment piece of this, which is a standalone course that you can take, um, begins next week, uh, and it will focus on investment. Uh, and the money and banking piece um, uh, will not start until November, but think of them as a whole. Uh, obviously, if you're an, you know, a, a professional investor yourself, you may care less about the money and banking system, and vice versa, if you work in banking, um, uh, or are a regulator or are an academic studying the banking system, you may have less interest in the investment piece. I think of these as, as one, two parts of a, of a single whole. And I would hope that people would, would, would join these explorations, not so much for the immediate practical application to their day job, but to help us wrestle with these really, really difficult questions about how to transform the entire financial system. Um, and maybe that's a, a, another way of saying that is this course is not designed for people. If you're an investor and you're managing a portfolio of public stocks, this course is not going to help you manage your public stocks better uh, the day after the course. And you're not going to improve your performance versus your benchmark as a result of something you're going to learn in this course. Th this course is for people who are curious and 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 realize the gravity of the current situation we're in, uh, what we call the poly crisis, intuitively understand that finance is perhaps the biggest elephant in the room we need to wrestle with and want to participate in the challenge of how do we reinvent, how do we remake finance that's not some sort of, you know, utopian vision, but actually grounded and rooted in practical reality of the system that exists but unafraid to ask the hard questions about what in finance we need to allow to die and eliminate and what in finance we need to cause to happen that's not currently happening. Um, there's a series of learning outcomes that are that are listed here. Um, uh, many, many of these we've talked about, but essentially we're going to question this whole sustainable finance industry that's developed around ESG and impact investing not to criticize it, but to recognize the limitations of what we've done so far. And by the way, we've been at this for over a quarter of a century. And in many ways, we're only just getting getting started in the hard questions. Um, we're going to um, um, uh, interrogate these unquestioned truths that that are lying below the surface that, that have yet to be uh, properly addressed, in my opinion. Um, uh, we're going to allow ourselves to be radical, um, as in getting to the root of the matter. And that will include not just the practice of investment, but uh, the practice of what we now call philanthropy. Uh, at some point, we'll develop a course on philanthropy, but think of investment and philanthropy as, as two ends of, of a spectrum of how capital flows. So we're going to address both of those in this investment course. Um, and if you're an entrepreneur, I hope it will, or I believe it will help you better understand what you're dealing with when you need to attract capital and 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 create investment uh, into your company um, and do it in such a way that you can preserve your mission. If you're an investor uh, or a wealth holder or, or a philanthropist, um, uh, I believe this will help you align your capital with the idea of a, of a, a financial system in service to life. Um, uh, and if you're a public stock portfolio um, uh, manager, the, the course is going to be a bit frustrating because you're going to be, you're stuck in a system of quarterly earnings and benchmarks. I totally get that. And um, and that system does not 
um, uh, serve the um, uh, the long term transformational needs that we have. And so you may actually conclude that um, you want to find something different to do with your career, um, or you may find ways to actually make some incremental progress within a system that is largely uh, broken in, in a way that's hard to imagine us changing. Uh, when we get to the money and banking course, um, uh, again, we're going to inter interrogate the, the, the core ideas that exist within sustainable finance as it exists today. Um, uh, and and push ourselves to think about how we can use the banking system uh, to better serve the transformation of the real economy. We're going to talk about central banking and demystify it quite a bit um, uh, and the role central banks can and I believe must play in this transformation that we're facing. Um, and then we're going to delve into the mystery of money and um, uh, and explore alternative money systems uh, that can be designed uh, in service of a regenerative economy. Uh, these are both traditional complementary currencies as well as the opportunity that blockchain and crypto uh, finance present for us. Um, and finally, if you're a banker working within the system, I hope you will gain some fresh perspective on how to drive inside your, your organization um, uh, some changes that will help accelerate um, our, our shift to a regenerative economy. You know, traditional, boring old banking is actually more important in many ways than um, the more flashy uh, securities trading and speculation activity. And we need to make use of the banking system that exists. And unfortunately, the policy response to the financial crisis has actually made that harder, not easier, um, because of the reductionist way that central banking, uh, uh, central bankers think and how uh, regulators think. Um, so we're trapped in a reductionist game that we need to break our way out of. A um, couple words on the course design for those who have never taken a Capital Institute course. Um, uh, I don't love the word lecture, but there's a lot of information that that does need to be um, uh, shared. And at least for now, um, a weekly lecture is the best way we found in doing it. I quite enjoy doing these live. Um, it's very different experience when it's live on Zoom than if you were to simply watch a pre-recorded video. Um, those of you who've taken our courses will attest to this, that the best, act, I, I often feel like I'm just kind of like the background music and the real action is in the chat, um, but you have the benefit of literally hundreds of other colleagues who are wrestling with all of these ideas and, and sharing resources in real time and critiquing what I'm saying and adding to what I'm saying. So it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a regenerative process. What happens in these live lectures uh, is way more interesting than what than what would happen in a in a live lecture hall with everyone sitting half asleep in, in a chair. Um, so that's one component of the course each week. And then on alternating weeks, um, we have what we call a discovery dialogue where I bring in a, a guest and, and enter into a dialogue with that person um, uh, and then open up that dialogue to the whole group. And so we get many perspectives um, or fresh perspectives other than just my own into the, into the program. And then uh, alternating Wednesdays, we do what we call a practice lab, which is essentially you know, turning it over to you all. Um, we'll give you a prompt, we'll give you a challenge and you'll wrestle with it together uh, with us, but but um, essentially uh, uh, doing the doing the investigation and and learning on your own and coming up with your own ideas, which is obviously the best way to learn. The final component of the course is the community itself. Um, once you join a Capital Institute course, you join a community that is now um, what we call our with life community. And between the Capital Institute courses and my partners at Enrhythm, the Enrhythm courses, there's now approaching 2,000 people that have taken these courses and are pursuing this idea of a regenerative economy and regenerative organizations. And so you'll have your immediate uh, community in this cohort, in this, you know, in in the, in in the upcoming course on finance, and that will be, you know, however many people sh uh, show up for that course. But you'll be part of this broader community, and um, you know the the long term theory of change here is that we will build a knowledge base of uh, of people who 
are committed to and believe in this idea of transforming our economic system and finance that drives it toward a living systems um, uh, framed approach. And, um, and this community will become a lifelong learning community for us all. So um, participating in this course gives you immediate access to that community, which I think is in many ways, probably the, in terms of the long-term, the most valuable uh, piece of, of the course itself. So that's all I have to, to share today um, uh, and would, would welcome your questions and comments on the, on the course, not so much on the content, but on the mechanics and practical questions um, as you all prepare to decide whether or not to join us uh, beginning next week. Unless I missed something, Rachel. Rachel always keeps me on track. By the way, I didn't, I didn't properly um, introduce you to Rachel, which I should have at the beginning, but Rachel is my um, co-pilot in the courses I teach. Um, she co-pilots from South Africa and um, uh, has no sort of um, uh, formal training in either economics or finance, and, and yet does a marvelous job um, holding the space for the community and keeping me organized and on track and on time. So um, uh, everyone who's joined us in these courses ends up loving Rachel, who's um, just a delightful human being and, um, and an integ integral part of, of the course. Thanks, Joe. What, what did Joel, I forget, Rach? Nothing forgotten. Great okay. job. That was awesome. So just anyone who has reflections or questions for John, um, or myself in this process, this is the space. And if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know if I should answer this question, it's probably silly. You probably should bring that question up because somebody else is thinking the same thing. So just encourage um, any questions or just reflections. Someone asks, is there a lot of math, John? Ah, that's a great question. Uh, that that is a really good question. There is um, almost no math. I'm I'm trying to. I don't want to lie. There might be a little bit of math, but this is not a technical course. This is a course that is more conceptual than it is technical. It's not designed. You know, there, there's not going to be um, some new risk models that we're going to run uh, alternative ways to think about value at risk, and you'll have to run. Uh, modeling exercises. It's um, uh, it's meant to be higher level, more conceptual. And I think, I, I personally believe that we rush into the analytics um, at the at the cost of of missing the big picture and the big questions. And so um, uh, this course is definitely geared more toward um, uh, the bigger picture conceptual issues, which doesn't mean that they're they're general, they're profoundly important. Um, I, I personally believe this is the most important thing that I can share, much more so than any of the analytical details that might follow. Um, uh, and that's why it's in, in the course. So I'm, I'm glad whoever asked that, I'm glad you did. Um, and that'll disappoint some people. Some people are looking for, you know, how do we develop a new value at risk model so that we can better measure uh, portfolio performance and portfolio risk. This is um, this is really not uh, about that. It's it's more conceptual. Thanks, John. The good news of that uh, is it means that if you're not a finance expert, you'll you'll be able to stay along with us for the whole journey. Yep. And as John said, I have no background and still learn and gain a lot every time um, I participate. Also, no people need to hop. Um, if you don't want to stay for Q&A, I did want to call out, please get hold of us direct as well. If you have any questions, I pop the email address in the chat. Uh, so if questions come afterwards, and then you can also find all the details on our website. So I posted that in the chat. There was another question, quick, I'm going to read from the chat, and then we'll hear from Vishpa and Anthony. Um, Patrick asked, can you only take money in banking course? Yes. So we have what we call the um, finance program, which includes both. But if you would only like to um, participate in one, you can buy them separately. And the course also we're opening. Um, so if you want to start with money, money and banking and that makes sense for you, you can join the next cohort the following year for investment. If after that one, you say, no, you actually want to complete the program. Um, we are going to offer that as well. Um, so thanks for that question, Patrick. Mm. Hi, Vishva. 
Hello, Vifa. Hello. So my question is, how much closer are you to the new theory of economics? Like this um, work with the program, the last finance course that you did, is it has it brought you closer to the new theory of economics that you were trying to conceptualize? I mean, I think um, I think there have been developments since your exposure. I think you were in the um, economics course, not the finance course. In economics. Yeah, um, I mean. Probably the this is a ongoing learning for all of us. I would say the most significant new feature that is that, that probably didn't exist when you took the course um, is this idea of ergodicity um, and and the, um, the the profound importance of thinking about investing in ecosystems uh, as opposed to investing in single corporations or enterprises. Um, that's something we're going to talk about in the finance course, and it's um, it's something that uh, and the, and and the discovery dialogue will be on that topic. So that's that to me is is cutting edge work. Um, if you're familiar with the idea of anti fragility, this is the physics underlying anti fragility. Um, and um, just as a as a quick aside, maybe a quick digress digression. I on this trip, I had the opportunity to go visit the Mondragon cooperatives uh, in the Basque country in Spain. And if if you're familiar with them, you probably know about them because they're, you know, a 75 year old example of um, a large scale cooperative ownership. Uh, I think the the there's there's about 80 businesses collectively 20 billion euros in sales um, started after World War Two by a Catholic priest. And um, uh, and it is an, an example of cooperative ownership. But what one learns when one goes to visit and asks the right questions is that it's actually a brilliant example of um, non-ergotic investment. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm getting a little bit technical. Most of us don't know what that word means. I didn't know what it meant about two years ago. But essentially, they do profit pooling across the 80 companies. And the effect of that is demonstrably tr mathematically true. It actually enhances the resiliency of the health of the whole. And so one of the, the quite profound and radical takeaways for me as a finance professional is that we in the venture capital world have been investing in and building companies uh, in a way that is actually extremely inefficient and wasteful. And um, and the result uh, and the result is that you know depending on what statistics you look at you know nine out of ten startup companies fail, whereas uh, in the Mondragon network they they have a bank that lends to startups that has a seventy five percent success rate, and that's because they are part of this ecosystem that I'll share with you more in in the course. So. A long way of answering the question, but I, I'd like to think that the new theory of economics is has been um, uh, has been born, but is still a toddler, and um, lots of the details to be filled in and um, uh, and developed uh, both in economics and in finance over the next twenty five years. I'm That's sure. Does the follow up that brings it back to the course? How does our participation in the course? amount to the development, the further developments of that theory and the practice? Well, there's there's a number of um, initiatives that have spun out of the course, uh, an example of the power of the community. So for example, there's an initiative on philanthropy that is being led by a, um, a course participant that I'm participating in. And that will lead us to a new theory of philanthropy at some point. Um, and there's a couple of course participants that are working on the idea of, or the question of what would regenerative technology mean and look like and how that will affect um, uh, the transformation that we're seeking. And obviously in with the, ri you know, the rise of AI has happened since we started this course, at least to, to you know, in, in the mainstream. 
And the implications of AI on all this are, are you know, we're just at the very beginning, but we're beginning to build um, uh, language models uh by 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 giving these computers holistic uh thinking as opposed to reductionist thinking with the idea that we'll develop language models that actually are good at what we need to be good at as opposed to accentuating uh in my opinion what we confuse about reduction the the the, the places that reductionist decision making is very helpful and useful and the places where it's not and and that there's a whole lot about that in the course so so yeah, I, I you know I'd like to think that I'm going to continue doing this until the day I die, and I'll continue learning until the day I die. And anyone who joins this course community will, will be participating in that ongoing learning journey. Great, thanks Vishva for your questions. Um, Anthony, we'd love to bring your voice in. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, first, I'd like to thank John for uh, for uh, putting together this overview for us uh, this morning. I think it was very helpful. I, I I have just a very basic question, and and I'm sure you've thought about this, but I, I should ask the question anyway. Um, to what extent does the course um, examine or make assumptions about human motivation? Uh, hmm. And because uh, because the reason, of course, why I ask this is that there have been numerous historical you know, numerous experiments done in the past where people have tried to put together economic systems that uh, have, for the most part, failed because they could not move human motivation to the extent that they thought that they could. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering about uh, the extent to which what your, what your courses are examining um, takes into account the degree to which human motivation needs to change or or maybe that motivation is already there but hasn't been sufficiently mm. tapped or appropriately tapped well that's a huge question as you know <laughs> um and i what shall i say briefly about it today i um i guess i guess i would start by saying that um, uh, if everyone that worked on Wall Street were a Boy Scout and honest and selfless and did the right thing, uh, the finance algorithm we've designed would still destroy life on this planet. Yeah. So um, I don't come at this from a ethics-driven um, perspective. I come at it from a kind of a objective, as objective as one can be, um, system design question with a very humble premise, which is that there's this system out there called life, living systems that have sustained themselves for billions of years. And, um, and we, in our, um, uh, you know, kind of, um, what's the right word? Um, it's, it, I don't even mean it to be critical. It, it, this is such a big, big question. Um, the, the, the premise is that we've developed, ever since really the scientific revolution, the genius of our reductionist problem-solving skill set, uh, often associated with our left brain. Um, and we've gotten confused that that skill set is really good at building things, making things, but completely incapable of managing things. And what we manage is our own health. Our, we manage living systems. We manage our own health. We manage our families. We manage our organizations. We manage the financial system. We manage the global economy. We manage the United Nations. And that's where we run into trouble is that we are using reductionist problem-solving thinking to deal with managing complexity, which is, you know, machines are complicated, living systems are complex. And so I start with the idea that that shift is, is, is a massive new way to see the world. It's a worldview shift. 
Um, but interestingly, when you get into this, let's call it for simplicity, right brain, holistic, intuitive, more feminine uh, way of seeing the world, you then reconnect with um, uh, the, the kind of non-mental ways of knowing, non-intellectual ways of knowing. And so you, you find yourself reconnecting with uh, the, the, um, uh, the issues of ethics, morals, and even spirituality. Um, and, and I'll maybe just leave it at that for today for your question, but, um, but I think you've just kind of gotten to the heart of the matter that to me, the, the pathway out of the poly crisis is that reconnection to this other way of knowing and nowhere has it been more damaged than in our short-term reductionist, um, optimized risk adjusted return internal rate of return thinking of, of finance. Um, and, and maybe the, the second um, candidate for the most dangerous would be the way we've applied it to technology. Um, and so those two together are the, are the, you know, we could say it in a positive way, the big leverage points that we need to wrestle with. So thanks for asking the question though. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Um, we're going to hear from Ben. Just before I um, ask you to bring your question forward, Ben, we had another question in the chat that I wanted to answer. I did put a response in, but if you're listening to the recording, I just wanted to call it out. The question was, will there be recordings of the sessions if you can't join live? So mm -hmm. yes, they will. all the sessions will be recorded and posted onto Mighty Networks that we use as our course platform. So that'll be our hub where you can gather with the community and listen to recordings and you'll have unlimited access. So there's no time bound on when you can go back and listen to those recordings um, as well. All right, Ben. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Hi, Joe. Good to Hi, see Ben, you. how are you? Hi, Good to, to be see you. here. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to... Oh, hey, Kat. Hey, Carmen. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> excited to hear about this uh, course again. Uh, and my um, grad school semester just ended, so this is a perfect timing for me. Uh, good. Um, I have a question. Like, actually, the course is um, right coming right on time because I'm actually working uh, on a community finance project right now, and with a community supporting organization that is an ecosystem builder. So when you talk about this course, is to um, financing investing in ecosystem rather than, you know, specific uh, subjects or um, uh, our projects, I felt mm -hmm. like this is the one, the course for me to learn more in order to do my work better. And um, also, this is my question, because you mentioned that may not help us to do our daily job. And also, you, I think you brought up some, uh, you critiqued some of the existing, you know, uh, impact investing, system thinking but I'm but I'm curious like how can we um leverage the learning to integrate into our existing uh, sorry in, yeah into into our existing series uh frameworks approaches uh rather than you know um criticize it <laughs> criticize yeah. and uh yeah so just yeah and I'm, I'm, maybe I didn't speak uh, clearly, that's something I often do. Um, to, what I was referring to about it not helping in your day job is if you're a portfolio manager managing public securities, stock portfolios, for example, or bond portfolios, and you're in a system where not only your compensation, but your ability to keep doing the job is measured on a quarterly or annual basis against a benchmark, and you're essentially picking stocks uh, to beat that benchmark. Th this course is, is not going to help you do that. In fact, there are people who have tried to set up quote unquote regenerative public stock investment portfolios. And I've cautioned them against it because I could give you 15 reasons why that's not a viable strategy. So when I, when I said it won't help you, I was meaning specifically if you're in that piece of the financial system, um, but but uh, I absolutely hope 
if you're working on something like investing in bioregions, that this will give you um, uh, both a conceptual framework and tools and frame framings uh, 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 in order to do that um, more effectively and more uh, Ill aligned with creating the conditions for health, which should cause the outcome of the projects to be um, significantly more uh, positive. And as a, maybe as an example of of you know why the value of the community. So you you may or may not know this since you're already in the community, but I think it was just last week we had um, uh, a a discovery dialogue um, with the founder of an organization called Common Land, which is one of the biggest global bioregional investing platforms that have been created. And so um, you know there's, there's sort of like the the cumulative experience of of um, of engaging with you know, what's still a fairly small little bubble of people that are trying to make this living systems economy a real thing. Um, but I hope that in 10 years, many of us will still be together and we'll remember when we first got started. And this will be the kind of the 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 go to play. I use the analogy of like, you know, Silicon Valley. Anybody who wants to start a tech company knows Silicon Valley is the place. I believe in 10 years, the world will realize we need to align with how life works and our with life community will become the place that, you know, recruiters go to hire the, the, the best people and, and we all go to engage and find partners to do new business projects. Um, so I hope, you know, it absolutely is intended to be practical. If I implied otherwise, I shame on me. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. And also wanted to just call out in this moment, um, I love how John came on and just announced that he is feeling a bit tired because he's on his three-week travel. And as we progress through this call, there's just more and more energy coming. And just wanted to call out that's John. Like every live session you have with him, I'm like, okay, John, we're at time. We need to get off now. And he just wants to- Hey, I like my day job. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, just wanted to uh, mention that as well. He really loves connecting and hearing um, from the community as we go through these courses. Carmen. Hello. hello, Carmen. Well, hello there. We try to get rid of Carmen. She keeps what? coming back. I uh, know, not, not possible. Um, so, yeah, I was the, in the first cohort of this course, and you took the risk, John, of of adding that practice lab, you know, in, in the, to the first time that you taught it. And I was with Ben in, in, in the project. And I, I, I say... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that your role is just to present us the overview of the theoretical framework of all of this, and you do it masterfully. Uh, but there are opportunities to really get into it with that practice lab, and also to go um, in the community to connect with other members of the course, and then see what we can create together uh, on a practical level. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Carmen. And we're we're um we're now beginning to develop kind of a whole new, you know, think of it as the 2.0 of this educational experience. And um, you know, I, I I believe that we're in for a lifetime of unlearning and relearning. Uh I think it's a um you know, I'm working on this because I can't think of anything else that's more important fully understanding what we're up against with a poly crisis. Um, but I, it begins with seeing the world a new way. And that that begins with, uh, particularly for those of us in the uh, in the Western world, um, uh, recognizing the um, the limitations of our of, of the education we've all received and the education that we're paying for our children to have as we speak. Um, and so it, it's not that it's wrong or bad, but it's 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 not suited for the challenges we're facing today. So um, I'm just noticing in the chat, Mark Weiss is saying Hazel Henderson must be very proud of you. Hazel's one of my my teachers, um, my inspirations. She was an incredibly courageous woman uh, who bucked against the tide of the 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 academy of economics and and she had it uh she had it almost perfect a uh, long long time ago so thanks mark 
Okay, thanks everyone. And thanks, Carmen. Uh, I know we had time, so I'm going to close out this room yeah. shortly, but just wanted to share a reminder that we're there to connect. If you have any questions after this, um, please reach out to us direct on email and we will be waiting with anticipation. Otherwise, uh, we hope to see you next week in the investment course. Any last thoughts and um, sharing, John, before we close out? No. Thanks for thanks for coming, everyone. I hope to see you next week. Great. Thanks all. The man that I wanna be today. If I could talk to him, this what I say.